Up everyone. Um, today we're just going to have a quick video just to walk through a discounted cash flow model from start to finish. Uh, let's just jump straight into it. Uh, by the end of this, you should have a pretty good idea of the concepts that you need uh, to go from start to finish. Let's just run through it now. Our valuation date, given that we're just going to assume we're starting from FY23F, let's just assume roughly the start of the financial year, which would be the 1st of July 2022. And to start off with, we just want to make some sort of higher level revenue assumptions. Typically, you'd have a actuals and a forecast model um, that you could perhaps base this off. But for the moment, let's just do some pretty round numbers and let's assume a revenue growth rate of 7.5%. Start with that. We've got 120 million times what we want is one plus cell and we want to lock that cell so hit f4 lock that cell again and we simply drag it across and that gives us effectively our revenue um, for these for these periods now we also want to make just to be sure that we're actually updating our revenue growth assumptions correctly we just put in some KPIs below and that effectively just take say, our revenue growth assumptions that we've um, been put up here. Now, I've got here normalized EBITDA and that's typically because sometimes a company might have one-off costs or choose to normalize certain items from their, their historical or forecast financials. Um, that, may actually indeed be one-off items. So to present on a normalized, quote unquote, normalized basis, this is where we get to. You hear it a lot in terms of pro forma EBITDA and things like that. So let's just make that assumption here. So we'll assume that our normalized EBITDA margin is 25%. Times by 25 and we'll lock that again. That's where we're getting to that's where we're getting to for each of the different periods. This is effectively what our normalized EBITDA margin is. And again, we can do our APIs as well below, and it should obviously equal the input that we've got there. Now, to get, we have to get effectively get back to normalized EBIT because this is what we're gonna calculate our taxes on. So we need to add back in our depreciation and amortization. So let's just assume say minus 2 million. Now this will obviously be built up in a bit more sophisticated manner if you're doing an actual fully fledged financial model where you'd have a schedule of pp and &E and any sort of new or recurring capex um, to calculate that but again for now just keep things simple just get the concepts right so that's where we're getting to with our normalized ebit taking off depreciation and amortization amortization would more so be related to any sort of intangibles or things like that but we'll just assume for the moment that's all we've got and then the tax income tax rate, let's just assume 30%. And the actual tax on our EBIT will be two times 30%. Lock that again. Now this has to be a minus because it's a cash outflow. And that is where we get to with our tax on EBIT. So that is one portion of it. Now we have to add back the depreciation and amortization because that's a non-cash item. It's the, the payment's already gone out the door effectively. So then we'll just go minus two. Add that back. And then in terms of capital expenditure, this might be, say if you're a drilling company uh, that you might have to purchase say, sort of drill rigs and, and other sort of vehicles or equipment in order to allow your business to even generate revenue. So there might be some sort of level of of CapEx that you need on a year to year basis. But for the moment, let's just assume that you're spending about $5 million a year on CapEx. Now to make this a little bit more dynamic, let's just sort of think about this a bit more um, critically in terms of the working capital absorption rate. So with all businesses, you typically have a level of working capital investment that you you need in order to generate a return on it on on uh, your revenue. So let's just assume a round number of say 
25%. Let's go 10%. We're not a, we're not a distribution business. Our revenue. And 10%. And that will be our working capital balance would effectively be in increasing. So that's the cash outflow. What have I done there, Scott? That's why you got to lock yourselves, right? That is effectively the cash outflow that we have from our increase working capital requirement. To sum that all up, and this would be our net cash flow that we would use for our discounting. So from there, So from there, we'll just bring down the four as well. This will make sense shortly. And then from here, now we have to calculate our weighted average cost of capital or more effectively what our discount rate would be. So let's just input some assumptions here that we would typically have a long-term growth rate of say 2.5%, which roughly mirrors inflation. And then the WAC will flow through from down here. And this is why these cells are colored in gray because they're dependent cells, they're not input cells. So all our input cells would be orange uh, and all the rest would be uh, based or dependent on the input cells rather. So let's just say our equity value is 100 million and the value of our debt is 75. And cost of our debt, let's just say 5%. 10 year treasury. Now this is typically a sort of a surrogate or a proxy that people assume for the uh, risk-free rate, effectively what returns would be in a, a riskless environment. So let's just assume 2.0%, but obviously with how uh, inflation and interest rates have been lately, this has moved um, moved <laughs> quite a bit in the last few years, but let's just keep things simple just to get the concept right again. And then beta as well, let's just assume 1.2%. We can delve into this a bit more in a bit more detail in another video. Then market returns, typical equity market returns, you look maybe 6.5% for the moment, all right? Now the cost of equity, effectively, we've got to calculate this using the capital asset pricing model. So this is be our cost of equity, it's our risk-free rate times by our beta multiplied by the, I guess, so, so the market returns less the 10-year treasury rate. So let's just go through equals risk-free plus beta times by your market returns, less your risk-free rate. And then we've got roughly here, 7.4%. Now that's now that we've asked, effectively got what we require for our cost of equity and our cost of debt, we then need to calculate the different proportions of the equity uh, and debt of our capital structure. Let's go through and do this properly. Divided by the sum of the two, seven percent, and then we want to just drag this up, and that'll be our debt. And then this is just a nice little check, just to make sure, because you should sum to hundred, and that's where we get to. Now, the weighted average cost of capital, which we are going to use for our discount rate, what we've got here is the standard formula: the equity. Uh, proportion multiplied by your cost of equity, your debt, cost of debt multiplied by your debt proportion adjusted for tax because you get the uh, tax deduction for that. So let's just go through and calculate this. Got cost of equity is 7.4 multiplied by the proportion, which is that. Now let's just put brackets around so this is nice and clean. That's the 4.2%. Our equity portion of the calculation and then we want to do our debt times our cost of debt and we also want to do one minus our tax rate which is calculated from here now you can lock these if you want but you don't need to because we're not going to be dragging these cells at all and then that's our whack of effectively 5.7 percent so that's what our uh, calculation is coming through here. 
Now you could play with these assumptions, obviously, if your beat is 1.4, so that means it's a slightly riskier or riskier or more volatile stock relative to the market, then you can go through with that. But let's just assume 1.2 for the moment. This is a, this would actually, in, in reality, this would be a pretty low discount rate, but let's just bear with it and um, use it for, the, for our learning purposes here. Now that we've got that assumption, effectively what we need to do here is discount back the cash flows here, but let's first calculate the terminal um, value based on the perpetuity growth method. So there might, there are different ways that you could do EV, but DAR multiples or, or other um, avenues to sort of cross check or, or triangulate different options. But this is a pretty tried and tested and, and um, useful item in practice. So let's just scroll down here. So this would effectively be our free cash flow in our terminal year. So our last free cash flow here, we have our 8.5, and then we want to multiply it by one plus our long-term growth rate, which we've got up here is 2.5%. Now much higher than 2.5% historically is just la la land. It doesn't exist. At least by how things have gone historically. <laughs> Now whack minus our growth rate. What we want to do is take 5.7 5 minus our 2.5. So that gives us 3.2. And then based on this uh, perpetuity growth formula, we want to do E equals 8.7 divided by 3.2. So that's our, effectively what our terminal value is. So that's 270 million. So let's bring that up here. And then we've got our cash flows that we have for our valuation based on our modeling, our very, very brief modeling. We go into detail of how you can model up um, a fully fledged three-way balance sheet, you know, PL balance sheet cash flow um, in later videos, but this is just a good way to sort of, um, a sort of entry level from that respect. Now here, our first period would be one year. Simplicity say add one to that. Because what we need to do is effectively discount these future cash flows back to present value because there is the time value of money um, aspect to it. So now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six um, periods that we're going to discount back. Now, what we need to do here is go one divided by bracket. And we want one plus our whack, which is our discount rate. And then we're going to lock that. Close the bracket there. And we want to do to the power of the period. Now, mid, there is um, a concept known as midpoint discounting, um, and that can result in uh, variations somewhat in terms of given that the timing of cash flows does play a role. But for the moment, let's just keep it simple. And in, in all respects, it doesn't have a sometimes it doesn't have. Well, it shouldn't make blanket statements, but it, it's not material in, in the vast majority of um, calculations. Although, it's, as I said before, not a blanket statement, depending on the business type as well. So now we have our cash flows, and then we want to multiply it by our discount factor. We can see here that effectively, what we're saying is the present value of our free cash flows from FY23 to FY27, and also based on the perpetuity growth model, um, comes to roughly uh, $219 million. So let's just go through down here and sum that up. And we've got 219. So that's a you know pretty straightforward way, pretty high level way. And you can see how you can flex a lot of these assumptions to sort of um, bring forward different uh, outputs and this is where sensitivity modeling might play a role is you might have um, one set of assumptions around normalized EBITDA dark growth or whatever it might be or margin or income tax or working capital absorption and all these different things play into the actual valuation along with the, the cost of equity given that has an impact on your discount rate but we're not just going to stop there we've actually got to also take that bridge from enterprise value to equity value because in all evaluations the, the whole concept is around getting back to your equity value and it's, and whether or not what you want to buy is is uh reasonably priced or within threshold to even um you know get a term sheet together whatever it might be so let's just start off with our ev 
based on this, we've got 219. And let's just make some, you know, pretty high level assumptions just around cash or investments. So let's just go 75, let's say investments are 50, short term debt 25, because you never buy debt. I've been yelled at a few times about that. Um, and then other debt like items. So you might have um, other items such as current long service leave or income tax payable that is effectively a current obligation for prior prior service or prior earnings or whatever it might be. So that concept is often utilized to sort of flesh out sort of, you know, it might be excessive annual leave as well. And effectively a buyer wouldn't want to bid or pay, effectively pay for, um, for those sorts of items. So our total adjustments here, 45. And then we've got our equity value, our adjustments, enterprise value rather plus our adjustments gets us to two, six or so that's a pretty sort of stock standard uh, methodology in terms of getting to your equity valuation and then say you might have you know ten thousand shares outstanding if this is a listed entity just do that divided by that but for simplicity's sake let's just put this to a thousands because always work in dollar values and that's where you get to a share price of 26.4 um, dollars so there you have it. It's pretty, pretty um, straightforward way, you know, from start to finish to sort of build it up from the ground up. And this is where, um, you know, most of the financial modeling aspects are important in terms of having a fully integrated three way model, because you have that visibility on working capital requirement on capex, on depreciation, um, revenue growth, you know, EBITDA margin, GP margin, all those things play into the ultimate value of the business, right? So Say, for example, we have our share price of $26. Say we think this business is going to go at 10%, not 7.5%. Not then our share price is up 30, 30 bucks. So you might have a view that a business might grow at, say, 10% or 15% rather. And you, if there is that um, differential between your calculated value and the current value of the business, then you might think it's a good, good option or a good buy or whatever it might be. Um, but I hope everyone found that useful. That was a relatively quick run through of how to build up a sort of very basic DCF model. But in terms of the actual complexity and how you how the, you go about the calculations, this is pretty much you know a base level of what you need. And it, but the, where the complexity does come in is around sort of capital expenditure and building out a model in a more sophisticated manner to sort of make sure that things are accurate. And um, uh, from that respect. So I hope everyone found that useful. Um, thanks for the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you, subscribe if you like this kind of content um, and have a great day. See you guys. Bye.